All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. It's a little bit past 11, so uh, good morning and thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Todd Martin. I'm the Outreach Coordinator with the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Uh, we're uh, proud to be uh, co-sponsoring this forum this morning on uh, solar energy, uh, specifically for Maine towns and cities. And um, I'm gonna kick it over to Nick Ashour from uh, KB Cog uh, to get us started this morning. Yeah, thanks, Todd. Uh, and thank you all for, for joining us today. Uh, like Todd said, my name is Nick Ashour. I'm a community planner here at the Kennebec Valley Council of Governments. Um, and I think we have a, a great and diverse speaker lineup today. And I hope you all find the, the information helpful. Um, as Todd said, both he with uh, the National Resource Council of Maine and Nick Lund from Maine Audubon are gonna be speaking. Um, Todd and Nick have really been the driving force behind this forum. And uh, they, along with their organizations, have also put together a fantastic solar guidance package that is circulating uh, among various channels. If you want access to that, um, Nick Lund has just um, linked that in the chat box, which you can find by uh, going to the bottom ribbon and, and clicking on the chat um, for him. And then also joining us today are Ben Axelman from Nexamp and Chris Byers from Boyle Associates on the development side and Peter Lafon from the town of Falmouth. Um, we are, will have uh, some time provided at the end of the presentations for Q&A. So please feel free to submit questions in the Q&A box on the bottom ribbon throughout the presentation. Um, but please just understand that we're gonna hold off on answering those questions until the presenters have spoken. Um, and then we'll, we'll wrap up with some closing remarks. So, so thank you and uh, all right. Here we go. So for those of you that don't know, Kennebec Valley Council of Governments or KV COG is a nonprofit regional planning office and we're located in Fairfield. Um, our service region is Kennebec and Somerset counties, but we also provide some assistance in neighboring counties and regions uh, where and when applicable. Um, and then, so what we do using a combination of federal and state funding and membership dues, we provide planning services to over 50 member municipalities, ranging from Jackman up north to Gardner in the south of our region and uh, really everywhere in between. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're seeing, there's been a growing interest in solar in our, in our region. Um, and there are many factors that are driving this interest. Um, most of the assistance that we end up providing has, has been general guidance and review of commercial development projects that are under five megawatts, typically found on leased land. Um, however, we are starting to see a spike in interest in community and municipal solar projects, uh, especially in areas that are otherwise unusable or unattractive for development, such as capped landfills um, and brownfields. Um, next slide, please. You know, so why are we seeing the uptick here? Well, um, solar development is active statewide and Todd will really um, hit on the policy aspect and, and what's driving um, this, this development boom in the state. But, um, you know, it often feels as though there's an increased interest in our region. Um, and there's really a lot of factors that go into um, siting solar projects, but a few components that make our area particularly attractive to solar development um, is that compared to Southern Maine, um, land in our area is affordable and plentiful. Um, and it's also often the case that many of the municipalities in our region have limited regulatory oversight on development. And um, finally, while our region is, is rural, we still have easy access to a lot of critical infrastructure. Um, next slide, please. So when we're, when we're asked to pr uh, provide assistance, the, uh, the most common concerns we hear from stakeholders typically are found on the land use side um, and whether that's you know, loss of land, uh, loss of heritage farmland or environmental degradation. Um, we also frequently hear concerns about potential financial impacts, uh, whether that's you know, abutting property values um, or municipal liability at the end of a project's useful life. Um, however, many of these concerns will be addressed today and can be further mitigated with more assistance and communication. Uh, next slide, please. So KBCOG can help in a variety of ways. Um, namely, we can provide 
technical assistance to planning boards and select boards. We can also aid with local ordinances and we can participate in public meetings. Um, so if you or your municipality needs assistance in any way, please, please feel free to contact me and uh, we will see what we can do. Um, next slide. And that's my contact information if you have any, any questions or concerns. Um, and uh, next up is Todd Martin um, with the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, trying to find my, <laughs> my unmute button. Uh, so thanks, Nick. Uh, thanks to all of our panelists for joining this morning. Um, as Nick said, my name is Todd Martin. I'm the Outreach Coordinator at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. Um, NRCM is Maine's largest environmental advocacy uh, and environmental policy organization. Uh, we have uh, been in existence since 1959, so uh, more than 60 years now. And uh, we have 25,000 members and supporters all across Maine uh, and across the country, people who uh, live in Maine year round or visit seasonally and who care about uh, Maine's environment now and for future generations. Um, one of the program areas at NRCM is fighting climate change and promoting clean renewable energy, both for the environmental benefits uh, of fighting climate change, but also for all the economic benefits that uh, renewable energy like solar uh, brings with, with job creation uh, and of course saving uh, towns money. Um, so this picture is a photo of, um, of our lobbying team over at the State House. Um, uh, really our bread and butter is, is working on, on policy at the State House in Augusta. Um, and uh, that's really the role that we play uh, here uh, uh, in the state of Maine. Um, and I'll point to the gentleman at the far uh, right of this picture. His name is Dylan Voorhees. Um, he's actually no longer with NRCM, but um, was our climate and clean energy um, director for about 14 years. And he just departed earlier this year. Uh, Dylan uh, was, uh, was critical uh, to passing strong solar policy in Augusta. And, and many of you uh, on this program today might have interacted with him. So just wanted to uh, give a shout out to, uh, to Mr. Dylan Voorhees. So my presentation is gonna focus on solar policy here in Maine, where we've been uh, and where we're going. Um, so this is a graph from uh, 2014, um, demonstrating that uh, Maine had installed the fewest solar panels per capita. Uh, of any state in, uh, in uh, New England uh, and uh, really the, east, the Eastern United States. We were uh, dead last in the amount of solar uh, installed, um, even behind New Hampshire. Um, and uh, this next slide demonstrates that we were also way behind and missing out on the number of solar jobs uh, that we had here in the state. Um, I graduated college in uh, 2010 uh, and I had many friends who went uh, you know, from college straight into the solar industry. Um, I had friends who I graduated school uh, with who were from Maine and who wanted to live and work in Maine in the solar industry, but were unable to find jobs uh, here in Maine in the solar industry. So they had to move to Vermont or New Hampshire or Massachusetts. Um, that is not the case now. Um, it is, uh, we're, we have a new day uh, for solar here in Maine. And before I jump into uh, the policies that, that passed in 2019, just last year, um, I also want to recognize that it's not just lobbyists who work for NRCM or other you know, uh, paid staff people who, who make policy happen in Augusta. It's really the people of Maine. Um, Mainers from all around the state worked hard for, for about six years uh, during the LePage administration um, to, to get Maine's solar policy right uh, and pass a better solar policy. So um, it really was the people of Maine um, that, that got us to where we are today. So solar in Maine, uh, where we're going. So after years of inaction uh, under the Little Page administration uh, with backwards rules and gutting uh, solar net metering, um, last year, uh, Governor Mills and her administration um, and legislators on both sides of the aisles um, supported uh, solar legislation that has uh, really uh, opened Maine for business um, in, in a big way to the solar industry. So the first uh, policy that I want to highlight that passed in 2019 was LD 1494. Um, and what this bill uh, did was it updated Maine's renewable portfolio standard, uh, the standard where um, Maine commits to getting a certain amount of energy from renewables, such as wind and solar. Um, as a result of this bill passing, Maine is committing to getting 80% of its power from renewable sources 
by 2030, that's just 10 years away, and 100% renewables by 2050. Um, and solar will play a key role uh, in reaching uh, re reaching these um, in the, reaching these goals. So this was a big one. Um, one of the very first things the Maine legislature did in January of 2019 was pass LD91, uh, which reinstated traditional net metering. Uh, you know, net metering, as we probably all know, is uh, how Maine homeowners get bill credits um, for the amount of solar that they're producing on their roof. Uh, and how, uh, and really how uh, solar owners can, can really afford to invest in solar. Um, net metering is used all around the country and all around the world. Um, and uh, the LePage administration gutted net metering um, in the middle of, of his term and um, actually started charging uh, solar owners for the electricity that they were producing on their own roof. So one of the first things the legislature did in 2019 was reinstate net metering, go back to the system that we were using uh, to compensate uh, uh, residential solar owners um, for the electrons that they were putting out onto the, onto the grid. Um, the big uh, bill that I wanna highlight that passed in 2019 in regards to solar is LD 1711. Um, this uh, bill did many things. Um, the first thing that it did was it initiated a competitive bidding process uh, to procure 250 megawatts of community solar. Uh, there's a, a, a limit of five megawatts per project. Um, and we are, we're seeing uh, many, many solar companies uh, coming to Maine, starting and building community solar projects and, and really looking for customers. Uh, I think uh, many of the residents in our, our towns have received flyers uh, or some other advertisement looking for folks to sign up for community solar farm shares. Um, which is fantastic economic development that we're seeing. Um, and there's, there's incentives uh, for these projects to be built um, on, on lands that have already been impacted, as, as Nick alluded to. And uh, Nick Lund from Maine Audubon will speak a little bit later about um, solar siting practices and, and guidelines. The other thing that uh, LD 1711 did was it really encouraged uh, the commercial build out of solar on Maine businesses. Um, so LD 1711 uh, will help procure 125 megawatts of commercial solar uh, to be built uh, at main businesses throughout the state. Um, and this is going to help main businesses uh, reduce their electricity costs. We're already seeing dozens of businesses around the state uh, taking advantage of, of uh, commercial solar. And the last thing, and probably the most appropriate for uh, today's discussion, is LD 1711 remove barriers so that main towns and cities uh, could go solar. Um, the big thing that this bill did was it allowed towns and cities to get bill credits, uh, not just on one energy bill, but to apply those uh, bill credits to multiple uh, multiple meters. Um, you know, I think we we all know that um, you know main towns and cities don't just have one one meter that they're that they're uh, using. Uh, this bill will allow uh, main towns and cities to to put bill credits from a solar array uh, to help. Uh, electrify and offset the cost of electricity at multiple municipal buildings. Um, so this was a big one um, and uh, many town managers and planning board officials and sustainability coordinators from around the state really lobbied uh, legislators in Augusta um, for this part of the bill. Um, and that is the end of my slides and I will turn it over to Ben Axelman from Nextam. Thanks, Todd. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Ben Axelman, and I work with Nexamp. Uh, we are a solar energy uh, development company uh, that's based in Boston and um, active developing projects uh, in Maine. Uh, so I wanted to basically go through and explain basically what do we look for? What are these projects? Uh, what do these projects entail? Um, what makes a good solar project from our perspective versus a bad one? Um, and, and so on. Uh, so just a, a very brief background on who we are. Uh, the company's called Nexamp. Uh, we've been in business for uh, about 12 years now, um, based out of Boston, founded by veterans. Uh, we've built hundreds of uh, megawatts of solar projects um, over uh, largely New England, although um, you know, we've expanded elsewhere as well. And we are backed by uh, Diamond Generating Corporation, which is a subsidiary of Mitsubishi. So, you know, we've been in the solar business for a long time. Uh, we've been watching the market in Maine. Um, and when um, things started to shift in, in Maine solar policy about a year and a half ago, uh, we began uh, developing projects here as well. 
Um, and I grew up in Maine, so I was very excited to uh, uh, be a part of this. Uh, so if you want to go on to the, the next slide. Um, basically, this is the, um, just a, as a very high level, you know, who are these solar companies? How do they make money? Uh, there are uh, multiple uh, companies in this space that do different things and make money different ways, right? There are companies who will develop uh, residential solar, put solar panels on your roof. Uh, either you'll pay for it, you'll own the panels, uh, or they will own it and rent it to you. There are also commercial scale uh, developers who are kind of working in this, you know, one to five megawatt space, trying to sell power uh, locally, either through community solar or to, you know, small businesses, towns, things like that. Uh, and then there's also utility scale solar, which you've seen a bit of in Maine, which is working on you know, 10, 20, 30 megawatts at a time, uh, tying in directly to the transmission system, uh, often trying to sell power uh, out of state to get renewable energy certificates from Massachusetts uh, or Connecticut. Uh, there are also, uh, you know, basically pure developers versus the ownership model. Pure developers uh, are companies that will develop a project and then look to sell it to someone else who will own it uh, and make money from a development fee versus the ownership model is, is what we do where we'll, we will develop the projects, but then we, our intent is to own and operate the projects themselves. Um, and the solar projects have multiple revenue streams here. Uh, one is the development fees, which is how the other peer, peer developers make their money. Uh, we also make money by selling electricity, selling renewable energy certificates, uh, and by uh, monetizing uh, tax credits on the federal level. Uh, if you want to go into the next one, um, that'd be great. So um, what do solar companies look for when we're deciding whether or not to move forward with a solar project? Um, it's a, a couple things. One is, you know, does the, light, does the site have solar access? Is it, is it shaded? Are there things that we can, you know, you know remove to allow for uh, solar to, sun to hit the, uh, the spot? Are there environmental restrictions that will prevent us from building solar there? You know, the solar industry uh, is tied to the same development restrictions that any development business is tied to, such as, um, you know, um, wetlands, uh, endangered species, things like that. Uh, is there access to the grid? Uh, is the site easy to build? Um, and is it compatible, compatible with existing land uses and something that is going to be, you know, embraced by the town and by the state? Uh, rather than opposed. So I'll, I'll dig into to each of these on the, on the following slides, basically. Um, or, oh, okay, so basically what goes into a solar project, um, in order to finance and build a solar project, you need to um, sign a bunch of contracts, basically. We need site control, which is a lease for whoever owns the land or building. Uh, we need all of our permits from the, uh, from the municipality and from the state. Uh, we need um, an interconnection agreement uh, from the utility that allows us to tie in at a reasonable rate. We need power sale contracts, so we need to be able to actually monetize the project uh, and, and you know, make money by, uh, by owning and operating it. Um, and then uh, lastly, taxation is a big uh, point here as well, which I'll, I'll talk on in, in, um, uh, once we get there. Uh, if you want to go to the next slide, that'd be great. So. Um, what does the site control agreement typically look like? Um, there's you know, multiple ways to do it. Uh, one is a, a purchase option where it's basically uh, us saying that we're going to purchase this property um, you know, after we've basically de-risked it. You know, under some circumstances, we'd buy it early, but usually we wanna make sure we've gotten all our permits and everything before actually purchasing it. More common is a, is a lease. Uh, so the lease uh, will typically uh, in entail, you know, one to two year development period, which will allow us to de-risk the project, get all of our permits, put together something that we can finance and build, you know, roughly six months to build these projects. And then they typically operate for 20 to 40 years. Um, and then after that, uh, you know, we uh, basically always have to have a, re a contractual requirement and usually some sort of uh, bond in place to decommission the project after the life of it. Um, lastly, a clean chain of title is something that's very important. We need to make sure that whoever owns the property actually owns it and that there aren't other people who have claims to it. So that's something that also comes up during the site control process. Um, next slide. 
Um, permitting is obviously very important here. Uh, we are subject to all town local ordinances. You know, Maine is a home rule state. Towns have a wide range of ability to regulate or allow or prohibit solar. Typically what this looks like is either a special permit or a site plan review uh, through the planning board uh, or in some cases zoning board of appeals. Um, there are also state permitting um, that get triggered on most solar projects, um, but there are certain triggers that will cause these you know, to, to, to happen. Um, you know, if we are, uh, site law is the big one. Uh, if you are disturbing more than 20 acres on your, um, on your project, uh, or uh, have 20 acres in aggregate across you know, multiple sites. Uh, that triggers site law, which is a state permit through DEP. Um, if there are any wetlands on the site that you're impacting, that also triggers a, a, an NRPA permit through DEP. Um, and also there are uh, Army Corps triggers as well if you are near vertical pools or a number of other things. Um, Lastly, you need to get a building and electrical permit for these projects. Um, and if you're doing a rooftop project, typically that's all you need. You know, there, there aren't a lot of other uh, discretionary permits for rooftop projects typically. Uh, you wanna go to the next one? Um, so interconnection is, is a, big, uh, a big driving factor for what makes a viable solar project. So uh, basically the way that the grid works in New England um, is that, you know, the, like, Central Maine Power or Amera can't tell you that you aren't allowed to tie into the grid. It's an open access, first come, first serve grid. Uh, what, so basically what the process entails is you tell, say CMP, I want to install five megawatts of solar at this location on this particular pole, this particular substation. They can't tell you no, but they will do a study to determine what are the impacts of putting this much power on the grid right here. Uh, because the CMP has certain reliability standards that they have to meet. Um, and if anything about your solar project, you know, uh, overloads the system or violates the reliability standards, they'll come back with some upgrades that you have to do either at your project to the lines or to the substation itself in order to allow for the project to tie into the grid and they come back with a uh, price tag um, and uh, you'll sign a contract called an interconnection agreement, which is basically you committing to pay those upgrade costs. And once all those upgrades have been complete, the utility will allow you to tie into the grid. So, you know, grid access um, everywhere is important in Maine specifically, where you have a lot of, you know, open, open land, but a lot of lightly loaded areas, not a ton of electrical infrastructure. Um, usually whether or not you can get a good interconnection is going to be what makes the project work or not. Um, so next slide. Uh, and then lastly, I wanted to talk on uh, power sales briefly. So, you know, the way that we uh, are able to, um, you know, make money off of these projects is by finding someone to uh, purchase the electricity that we buy. Um, so that, and this is the, the largest revenue stream for solar projects, things like renewable energy certificates and tax credits are, are secondary. So um, there are a couple different types of projects that are, are being vi are viable right now under this current uh, you know, solar program. Uh, one is uh, the classic you know, cell, uh, commercial or institutional um, uh, power purchase agreement where you'll find say like a hospital or a town who has a large amount of power use and is expected to continue to use power for 20 years. And you'll sign a contract with them saying that you will, they will agree to purchase this power, you know, at a 15% you know, discount over 20 years. Um, and then you're able to finance your solar project off of their credit rating. Um, there's also um, a secondary type, which is uh, incentivized in Maine is something that NextAmp does a lot, which is community solar. And I know that that had already come up. Um, community solar, similarly to that, it, it, um, it is basically instead of us selling to one large credit worthy entity, it's us selling to hundreds of individual households um, and basically distributing uh, net energy billing credits onto their bills um, and having them, you know, pay back, pay us, um, you know, uh, with a discount uh, to save money on their electrical bills. Um, doing that has a number of benefits. One, it lets us get a slightly higher reimbursement rate because the uh, residential rates are higher uh, that we're getting on people's accounts. Um, and it also allows us to kind of defray risk. So we don't have to do credit checks. We don't have to do, um, the, the credit worthiness of the off taker is less important if it's spread out over a hundred households. Um, 
And uh, basically these, these are programs that are incentivized by the state, but are set up on a company by company basis. So what's in the contract that you're looking at uh, is, is very important. Uh, there were provisions to make sure that, you know, that the companies are acting in good faith in the solar bill, but I would still make sure that if you're considering a, um, a solar contract, you look at how much, energy, how much are you going to save? Uh, are there fees associated with signing up, with canceling, with, and with canceling it early? Um, and just if you were to sell your house in five or 10 years, you know, what would be the implications of switching or if you wanted to do solar on your house as well? Uh, so I'm uh, happy to talk about that more in the questions if there are specific comments, but um, you know, that's something that's out there. That's why people have been getting a lot of uh, notes in the mail about this. Um, it's, it's, you know, legitimate, but it's, um, you know, it's very, uh, it's important to, to look at the details. Uh, I think that was all that I had. Um, happy to talk through more, but now we're going to move on to uh, Maine Audubon and Nick. Uh, thank you, Ben. Hey, everybody. Nick Lund here from Maine Audubon. Uh, we are a conservation organization working to protect Maine wildlife and wildlife habitat. Uh, we achieve that in a number of ways through education, conservation, and advocacy. Um, Maine Audubon has been a major supporter of renewable energy for decades. Uh, when our Falmouth headquarters was built in the 1970s, it was on the cutting edge of green design. Um, these here, these uh, panels in the photo you see are in our North Meadow at our uh, Falmouth um, Gills and Farm Sanctuary. And uh, combined with some rooftop panels that we have, we're about 75% powered by solar currently. Um, we're still major supporters of solar energy. Uh, we love what the governor and the administration is doing right now. Um, but we need to make sure that we balance our desire for solar power with our mission to protect Maine wildlife and wildlife habitat. Um, as Ben said, like any development or construction, wildlife and wildlife habitat might be impacted. So minimizing the natural resources impacts from solar will help maximize the benefits to users and to the landscape. Uh, and that means consideration into where we site these solar panels. Next slide, please. So um, when towns or individuals are considering developing their own solar installations, they should put some effort into finding locations that minimize landscape impacts. Um, this here is a report that uh, we released in November uh, outlining how the state can take advantage of renewable energy while still protecting renewable, uh, while still protecting habitat uh, for wildlife. Um, we worked with uh, a bunch of other groups, including many of the groups on, on the call today, um, uh, to develop also a best practices document outlining how to avoid and minimize impacts to natural and agricultural resources. And finally, we've also helped develop a model ordinance that towns can use to develop smart policies for the placement of their installations. Um, all of these documents are available on the Maine Municipal Association website. Um, the link is in the chat and um, I can, we can put it there again if you don't see it. Um, and then representatives from most every town in Maine received hard copies in the mail um, in September, this past week or so. Um, also, if you didn't, would like some of those, uh, please get in touch with me. Um, but what I want to do now is go through basically the, the major recommendations of our report. Uh, and so that's what I'll do starting now. Todd, if you go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so number one, when you're thinking about where to site solar panels, please, uh, we hope that you uh, prefer to use disturbed, developed, or degraded habitats. Um, so this includes landfills, brownfields, which is properties that have been, uh, you know, complicated the development for there's hazardous substances or pollutants. Um, places like roadway medians, parking lots, rooftops, of course, um, underutilized uh, industrial or commercial sites, sand and gravel pits. Um, using these spaces that are otherwise sort of undevelopable or undesirable, um, it avoids a lot of the potential impacts to wildlife habitat, right? Forest clearing or soil disturbance. Um, and it takes advantage of underutilized space. Um, of course, here I should shout out rooftops as, um, you know, the least impactful um, way to install solar. Um, and Ben said uh, it's sometimes that's the easiest to permit. Um, so here's an example in this image of a, of a four acre project in Portland, a place that I know as Dragon Fields. Um, it's a capped landfill uh, and was developed by Revision in 2018. Um, Maine has about 1800 acres of capped landfills, uh, enough for about 250 projects of this size here. 
Next slide, please. This is a gravel pit installation here in uh, Durham, New Hampshire, also done by Revision. And next slide, please. Um, this is the transfer, ta uh, transfer station uh, in the town of St. George, Maine. You can see it's a root, big rooftop project there. Um, this supplies about 90% of the town's energy needs um, in this station here. Next slide, please. And this is the uh, Kennebec Sanitary Treatment District buildings uh, or site. Uh, you can see here all the panels sort of descending down the hillside there. Um, 2,800 solar panels here. It, it offsets uh, about 85% of the energy from this um, sanitary treatment center. Um, and that saves about uh, more than uh, 1.2 million pounds of CO2 per year. So number two, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, in addition to the degraded habitat, uh, we're hoping that folks could avoid and minimize impacts to sensitive wildlife habitats, of course, and high value natural resources. So this includes all habitats identified as significant wildlife habitats under Maine's uh, Natural Resources Protection Act, um, endangered species habitats, rare plants, cold water fish, wetlands, as Ben mentioned, uh, focus areas of statewide e ecological significance. You know, really important environmental areas are of course places that uh, we hope you would avoid as you're thinking to site your solar panels. Um, a great place to start here on the next slide um, are these maps. So this is um, some, a project uh, done through the state called Beginning with Habitat. Uh, you can find these maps at beginningwithhabitat.org. They're GIS maps um, where you can, um, with the different colors, show the different natural resource values, right? Um, it's a little tough to see on this screenshot, um, but uh, this is uh, Fairfield, I believe, right? Um, uh, you can see uh, which places have significant resources, uh, which places uh, are maybe a little, bit, a little more amenable to potential solar development. This is a great place to start as you're thinking about how to get started with, with um, finding places to put your panels. Number three, um, we, we really hope that folks avoid, if possible, uh, impacts to intact forests, right? Um, forests are important for a million reasons, habitat, wildlife movement, ecosystem services, um, and keeping the landscapes we have intact is critical. Um, avoiding forested landscapes helps maximize the benefits and carbon reduction of solar installation. Um, and this is a real issue. Uh, in, in Massachusetts, uh, about uh, 6,000 acres of forested or farmland was converted uh, in the five years between 2012 and 2017. Um, next slide, please. Um, of course, you can minimize your environmental impacts by uh, locating solar developments as close to existing development as possible. Um, this helps uh, certainly with uh, transmission issues if you have to uh, develop new, new power lines and things. Um, Co-locating those lines with existing roads or lines uh, is preferable. And then finally, um, working on vegetation management around the site. So next slide, please, Todd. Um, restoring or maintaining native vegetation at the site. So um, solar facilities can actually benefit the surrounding landscape if there's attention paid to planting native plants, for example. Um, the meadows around facilities can become pollinator gardens, uh, increasing the amount of insects and bird diversity in a region. Um, this is tricky to do. Um, so for more information about which plants to plant or where to get them, you can contact Maine Audubon uh, or the Wild Seed Project or find other resources online. Uh, Maine Audubon uh, in the state is currently working on vegetation guides for solar developers uh, who are looking to plant uh, beneficial native landscapes in their areas. Um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Pete LaFond and I live in the town of Falmouth and I'm here today to discuss um, our journey to uh, solar, if you will. Uh, we are very close to placing a 1.5 gigawatt solar array on the surface of our closed town landfill that will produce roughly 70% of the town's energy needs, save the town approximately $100,000 a year and $2 million over the life of the facility. So how did we get there? And I'm not speaking in any official capacity for the town of Falmouth, but 
The town of Falmouth has a recycling and energy committee. I was on that committee and a sustainability coordinator, Kimberly Darling, who also worked on this. Working with the committee and Kimberly, we started to try to fulfill our mission for the town, which was to save the town uh, money on energy costs and to reduce the carbon footprint. So we started looking at ways to do that. Some were more obvious, like uh, LED uh, street lights and so forth. But solar's promise was immediately apparent to us. So about two years ago, we started investigating solar in earnest. Kimberly had done a lot of work on that previously. And on the committee, I and others, one other person really took responsibility for making sure the project moved forward because there are inevitable fits and starts to moving from no solar array to fruition in a solar array on the surface of a landfill. And there needs to be a person who, or persons who will be the engine that keeps, keeps it moving through. We're now, we have entered into a contract for installation and we're in, we've moved into the permitting process. Um, what we discerned pretty quickly was that the, the, the graphs, if you will, of the efficiency of the panels, their durability, and the favorability of the legislation that Todd talked about previously, all coalesced to make this project feasible for us. Before the law was changed, it really wasn't feasible. And the town councilors at that time said that they did not think that the project could move forward efficiently um, it, it, without a change in the law. I, one of the things I did was to go up and testify with many, many others in support of the new legislation, which had two critical factors for our town. One was to allow, to increase the size of the uh, facility such that it could be efficient for us, uh, up to five megawatts. Ours is 1.5 megawatts. That made a huge difference. And also uh, removing the limit on the number of accounts uh, was another critical factor. And I won't get into how technical that is. So, when we began, we went through several steps to solar. Uh, we did our research. We talked to people in the town, including town councilors at that time, about the idea generally and how receptive they were to it. And basically they said, hey, if you want to investigate this and come up with a proposal, go ahead. So we did. And then we presented to the town council and the town council said, yeah, hey, that sounds interesting. Save money, reduce the carbon footprint, go ahead and try to bring this to a concrete proposal for our approval, which we did. And I presented that to the town council and they gave us the go ahead. And then started the planning. Uh, initially, we met with a, an engineering firm uh, to discuss the overall 40,000 foot feasibility of what we were looking at. Uh, our site, our three phase power, um, where we, uh, you know, where the neighbors were around uh, the solar array and so forth. And he said it, it seemed feasible. We went up and talked to DEP and asked them whether it looked like this was a site that could be permitted, they said it was, without committing to actually doing that. We're in the process of that now. Then we, uh, we put out an RFP, a request for proposal, to receive proposals from companies that would actually do the installation and with whom we establish a power purchase agreement. And then we actually entered into a contract with one of them. We chose what we thought was the most favorable for the people of the town of Falmouth, and we're now in the process of uh, obtaining the final state and federal permits. So for us, the process was about two years. 
I don't think it needs to take that long. One of the delays for us was uh, waiting for the legislation to change. So I'm happy to answer any questions. My email uh, is, uh, address is down at the bottom of uh, this slide deck and I uh, welcome your questions later as well. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Great. Um, my name is Chris Byers. I work for uh, Boyle Associates. We are an environmental consulting firm that works in Portland. And I have about 10 years of experience working in the solar industry, ranging from uh, building projects to developing them. And now working as a consultant, we are working on probably 70 different projects across the state. Um, ranging from you know one megawatts all the way up to 20 megawatts in size uh, we've we've you know kind of been able to develop some core values here about how to uh, do responsible project development given our cross section so um, you can go to the next slide um, so you know we're I, I know this maybe sounds obvious but we're keen on working on real projects and I think it's important that as towns are seeing a lot of these projects come into uh, into the doors, you've got a lot of developers coming in and many are asking us, are these even going to happen? And I think that the, the huge amount of interest in these projects is probably going to create a large amount of uh, developers coming in that will speculate and maybe uh, figure out if it's real or not. But our firm is focused on working on projects that are actually going to benefit Mainers. Um, and that's what's great about this new program is that all the power for these small distributed generation projects all that power has to stay in Maine. We can't ship it out of the state. We're gonna be keeping it here to not only benefit um, residential customers, but we're also benefiting uh, towns, uh, not only maybe from a power purchase agreement standpoint, as Peter indicated, but also maybe some tangible benefits um, to provide revenue um, to the town along the way. Um, next slide. Um, so, you know, we work uh, as consultants, not, not just on the environmental side doing wetland work, but we also will uh, try to help our clients figure out what makes a good site. And I think, you know, every site is unique. Um, we are developing projects that are on uh, fields like the one you see here. Um, we are also developing projects on projects you know, that are in the woods. Um, we're doing them on landfills. We're doing them in gravel pits. Um, we really try to take it case by case. And I think part of the, the process that I would encourage towns that are interested in this conversation is to engage early and often with the developer. Sit them down and, and have them explain to you what's going on with that project. Um, just a page turn. It doesn't have to be a, a really complicated thing. Ask them to do a site walk. We always want to put scrutiny on every single site so that we can make sure that we're um, looking at the different constraints um, you know, for each project. Um, I guess uh, one of the other things that's interesting on certain farms, we've found that, um, you know, maybe dairy farmers, for example, uh, they've got uh, volatile milk pricing. And so their ability to create a diverse revenue stream by taking the worst producing part of their field that they can never grow anything on and putting a solar project on that provides them with year round lease income while also providing room for a community solar project to benefit their neighbors and saving money. So you know, we try to you know, balance all of the different constraints. Um, as Nick was indicating earlier, the goal is to uh, minimize wetland impact, stream impact. We don't wanna uh, impact any significant wildlife habitats. That is absolutely critical. Um, you can go to the next slide. And one of the ways that we also do this is to engage with different stakeholders. Um, so we have abutters, we have uh, the town, we have code enforcement officers, we have the landowner, we've got the client, and we also have regulators. And so I think this forum, apart from also doing other things, is, is a great way for us to bring education to the space. Um, every time we go into towns, it's always like, we have so many other things going on, we don't really know much about this. and so. I know even in the Kennebec Valley, we've worked with the town of Winthrop uh, quite a bit, just on our own time, um, helping them walk through maybe how to do permitting. Do they need an ordinance? Do they not need an ordinance? 
Um, I think it's important for everybody involved in this industry to understand that towns are up against this huge amount of pro uh, projects coming in and it's, it's help helpful if we can all um, you know, sit down and help them walk through it because it's a relatively new, uh, a new thing for Maine. Uh, next slide. So a um, couple of things that we, we use in our design as we're looking at this from a permitting perspective, um, you know, the solar panels are not regarded as uh, impervious by the DEP. Um, and so the, the DEP, in fact, sees these as very low impact. Um, They're typically pile driven systems. The solar panels then span over these, these piles, as you can see in my slide here. Um, and we're able to grow grass uh, underneath the solar panels and in many ways create habitat for birds and um, even fringe habitat from the edge of a forest um, to the field for other uh, bats and mammals that need to have that fringe habitat. Um, oftentimes our fences look like this. We try to move away from chain link uh, when possible. We'll use this agricultural style fence that's usually seven to eight feet tall. Um, and then uh, this particular picture is, is, a, is an image kind of just post construction, so it's been seeded. Um, so they're not going to look like this, but uh, the idea is to create maybe some plantings around the edge where there's visual buffering needed. Um, but a lot of this just comes down to common sense. Uh, we want it to be able to integrate into the community. We want it to not be front and center, but we still need these projects to happen if we're going to hit our goals. So it's a balancing act of where can we put these in the best spot and how do we make them look good? And oftentimes, back to my previous slide, that is best accomplished through those community conversations. Um, I guess, and then the last slide. Um, and so, you know, I guess one of the things that we have uh, endured in Maine and are uh, trying to integrate projects into this is that, um, you know, we want to be able to learn from our neighbors to the south, like Massachusetts and Vermont and New York. Um, they've all had robust solar programs out there. But part of what we're trying to do here is to work together as a group. So me and then others at Maine Audubon and maybe even people like Peter, um, trying to be able to grow this um, uh, industry without creating unintended consequences. Um, I, sometimes I get worried that we might try to like latch down too hard on where we can and can't put solar. But I think more of it's just about having those conversations and not moving too quickly. So I'm happy to be a resource. If towns ever want to call me, I get called all the time. It's on my dime. We absorb it as overhead as consultants um, to just field questions. Um, so if you ever feel like you're moving quickly, or you have to have to pass something, happy to chat through that um, and, and uh, make sure that we're making this uh, an industry that's going to last and one that's really going to provide us with an environmental and economic benefit. Thanks. Excellent. Great. Well, uh, thanks to all of our panelists this morning for this uh, great information. And uh, thanks to everyone who's tuning in today uh, for bearing with us for 50 minutes of content. Um, uh, now we want to hear from you. Um, so uh, two things here. Um, first, um, if you have a question for any of our panelists, um, please type it now in the Q&A box, uh, which is at the, the bottom ribbon of your Zoom screen. Um, any question you have for anybody that you just heard from, um, and while you're thinking of your question, I actually want to launch a quick poll um, to get a sense of um, where folks who are tuning into this webinar, how far along in the, the process you are with solar. Um, is your town just sort of exploring the possibilities of solar? Have you been contacted by a solar developer? Are you already in a partnership with a solar developer on a project? Do you have a project in the, the queue um, on the grid? Um, have you started construction or is your solar array operating? So just want to take a quick pulse uh, of the audience here. Uh, this will help uh, during the Q&A section. So I'll leave this poll open for just another couple of seconds. And uh, again, please type your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, we have uh, about 40 minutes for questions, so uh, plenty of time. And the other thing I'll mention uh, is this webinar is being recorded and you'll all receive a link to this uh, recording uh, in a follow-up email in the coming days. And I'll also include the contact information um, for, for all the panelists. So if you'd like to reach out uh, with a question, um, you'll be welcome to do that. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So looks like uh, uh, seven of you are just learning about the possibilities of solar for your town. Uh, six have been contacted by a developer. Uh, one uh, is, is already partnering with the developer. 
a couple have projects in the queue and have started construction and a few actually have a solar array that's operating. So a good healthy mix uh, here. So let's jump into the questions. Um, let's see here. Let's go with, um, so there's a question, um, uh, are there any examples of towns in Maine or in other New England states entering to joint power purchase agreements together? So towns working together on a, a PPA. Um, maybe Chris or, or, ben, or Ben, could you answer that question? Uh, sure, so um, there have certainly been uh, consortiums of towns who have gone out to bid together. Uh, there was a big uh, consortium of uh, a number of uh, towns and businesses that went out to bid early on in the process. Um, and I think that that's a, a, good, uh, a good way to do it uh, because by, uh, by pooling together, um, you know, often towns will hire a consultant to help run a bidding process to ensure that they're getting a good bid and getting good contract terms. Uh, and by you know pooling together a couple towns, that's certainly a good way to cut down on those costs and also make, ensure that you have a large enough uh, pool of power that um, you know the developers would be interested in it. Um, in terms of actually contracting, I think the actual contract would be um, you know done separately uh, because that, otherwise you run into some uh, creditworthiness issues. Um, basically, you would have, but you know, if you went out to bid and you know, say you pick Nextamp, Nextamp would you know negotiate with both you know Town A and Town B, and then enter into the same form for for both. So definitely a viable way to do it. I think um, one of the uh, some some towns have keyed into the fact that if a project is happening in their town, they would like to buy power from that project. And um, that's not absolutely necessary. As long as you're in the same utility territory, you can purchase power from any project. So if you're, if you're uh, the, the town of Bristol, you can buy power from a project that was built in York because it's within CMP territory. But I think there's some optics here that towns are keying into where they say, hey, that's really cool that you're developing a project in our town. Maybe we wanna, have like a community open house so people can buy power from that specific project. Not necessary, but there's a sense of ownership. And so when you have that ownership where, you know, you drive by that thing every day and you're like, that's really cool. That thing is helping our town. I think that's why towns seek to, to have a project that's like their own thing, maybe not buying in bulk, but that they, they want to uh, negotiate with the developer uh, to develop that power purchase agreement. So I think a lot of it depends. It's certainly not necessary to get the best pricing to go out to bid as a group. I think that's the goal is to get bulk pricing. I think that the competitiveness of this market is going to drive pricing down and allow towns to actually be in um, a, a good position to negotiate with developers to get the best price possible. Great, thank you both for that answer. Um, Nick Lund, I'm gonna uh, put this next question to you. Uh, it's a question from uh, Sarah Haggerty who asks, uh, if Maine Audubon has a solar siting map that includes where landfills and brownfields and gravel, gravel pits are in the state, um, as well as electrical infrastructure, um, is, do you, does Audubon have a map like that? Indeed we do. Um, thank you, Sarah Haggerty, my colleague uh, who developed this map, uh, which <laughs> I neglected to mention at the top. Um, yes. Uh, uh, mainaudubon.org slash energy. Uh, it's on our website there. Um, and um, Sarah and her colleagues, our, my colleagues uh, and the others she worked with did a fantastic job uh, developing this map. Um, so check it out. Thank you. Great. <laughs> I knew that name sounded familiar, but I couldn't pinpoint it. Um, great. So uh, there's a question about uh, tax implications for solar projects. Um, uh, I guess either Chris or, or Ben, I'll, I'll pitch this to you or really anybody who can answer it. Um, the question is from Jared Pinkham who asks, what are the tax implications of solar farms? Do the arrays get taxed on personal property? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, take, I'll take that, Todd. Um, so from a tax standpoint, um, you know, we get a lot of questions like what's in it for the town. Um, the land tax is still typically paid under the lease because as, as uh, Ben indicated, a lease is the most common form of uh, title right and interest for these projects. Um, currently, the status quo in the state is that there is uh, the ability for these projects to apply for tax exemption. 
in which case if they do that, then the state would reimburse the town for 50% of what the tax revenue would have been um, on, this, on, the on the project. The challenge with that is that the state didn't really anticipate how much uh, interest we would have. And I don't think that there's enough money in that fund um, to satisfy these projects coming in that are gonna apply for the tax exemption. So we've had some good discussions with the uh, Maine Governor's Energy Office recently about this. And I would encourage anybody who's um, interested in this at the, at the municipal level to reach out uh, to Melissa Winnie uh, and, and talk about this with her. Um, and so in February, one of the, one of the um, realizations was that this is a program that's not really gonna work. Um, to have tax exemption that the towns need to realize some tangible benefit. Uh, and then coronavirus happened. So all of these discussions got tabled, um, but there were some productive conversations to a certain degree that allowed us to get insight as to where this is likely headed. And so we, we, are, we are probably gonna see the towns be able to have some simple metric to realize tangible benefits. So if you have a four megawatt project, Maybe it's $2,000 per megawatt per year. So I don't know if there's an escalator or whatnot. Again, it's being shaken out, but they might be able to get $8,000 per year for this project. The idea is to create predictability, not only for towns, but also developers. You know, developers like Ben are gonna to wanna to come in and know what's the program that I'm working with here and how do I be able to, how can I move forward with the project um, so that's, that's really where we're at with the tax uh, piece of this, um, is that it's, it's in, in process, uh, there's not a clear answer, um, but I would encourage you to reach out to the Maine Governor's Energy Office, and uh, they can provide you with insight as to how they're supporting and making sure that towns do realize a tangible benefit out of this. Anything else to add on uh, tax issues anybody wants to jump in on? Uh, if not, uh, I'm going to direct this next question uh, over to you, Pete. Um, it's a question ab about uh, what areas towns need support on uh, to get past key challenges they're facing uh, with solar siting and permitting. So from the town of Falmouth's experience, you know, what were the areas where, you know, you really needed to rely on sort of experts um, and, uh, you know, where, where you needed advice to move through the process? Um, the, well, obviously the engineering, um, it, is this a, once you roughly decided what site might be a good site in your town, um, you need to call it, we thought we needed to call in an engineer and say, look, here's our idea, here's the proposal we put together. Is this feasible on the landfill up here? Is this landfill in decent condition? Um, do we have three-phase power? Do we have, uh, it, what about environmental permitting? So that was critical. And then we, uh, all during this time, we were meeting with NRCM uh, to, uh, in solar meetings. That gave us a kind of general idea of what was going on. Uh, we were following what was going on in the legislature. And the next juncture where we needed a professional was the, uh, we hired an attorney who specializes in analyzing contracts uh, because we put uh, an RFP out and eventually we were gonna contract with a company to do the installation. And so we had that lawyer review that contract to make sure that the terms in it were favorable to the town as well as the developer. Great, thanks very much, Pete. Um, ben, I'm gonna uh, kick this next question over to you. It's from uh, Bruce Burgoyne, who's uh, calling in from Reed Field. Mm -hmm. um, Bruce uh, says, this is kind of a long question, but my town is small, population of 2,500, and our town is interested in, in solar for a small power purchase agreement. The advice that we received about a year ago seemed to indicate that small projects were just not as viable as larger municipal and private developments. Um, and that we would be ignored or unable to get a solar project in our town off the ground. Um, is this currently true or has the new law uh, made small towns attractive and viable for, uh, for small solar projects on town halls, transfer stations, um, et cetera? So, sure. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, I think that 
uh, larger projects are going to get economies of scale that you're not going to get on smaller projects. So there are going to be some people who will, uh, you know, be less interested in that. But uh, I still think it, it's certainly viable um, and uh, it, it should work. Uh, the, the biggest things to consider when you're looking at, you know, developing a, a you know, a smaller, medium sized solar project on your property um, is going to be, uh, you know, one is, you know, the age of the roof is, is, is the, um, you know, is the project going to be able to support it? Do you have enough load to purchase it all? Um, and then the other big one is um, the creditworthiness. So the, the issue that you run into with small towns is often that they don't have a credit rating or they don't have a, a strong enough credit rating, which is something that larger towns typically do have. And um, so if you're doing a, a one-off project where, you know, say NextAmp would own a, own a solar project and, you know, sell power at a steep discount to a town, um, you know, they need to be able to, uh, to finance it. And uh, the creditworthiness is, is potentially an issue. There are some workarounds for that. Um, if you can do a, a, you know, sell some of the power to a creditworthy off taker and then uh, basically set it up as a, a community type thing and, and cover some of the town accounts that way. There are some ways around it. Um, and, you know, the, the benefit of doing a smaller project is often that you can get around transmission constraints. So while the first round of big solar projects in Maine, I think have focused on locking up land by, you know, substations where they think there's going to be a cleaner way to tie in. Um, I think you'll get a, a, a more of a look now uh, for smaller sites where, you know, if there's on-site load, there might be less, um, you know, there, there might be fewer constraints and, and more of a path forward now versus waiting for a transmission study in a, in a congested area. So I would say uh, it's certainly worth looking into. Um, it certainly can be a good project. Um, and there are, there are certain ways that you can uh, look at doing it to uh, make it more attractive as a project overall. Grant, anyone else want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think, um, Bruce, I really appreciate your question. And I think the other part of this is that if a smaller project that you're looking to do in the town is not viable and you perhaps don't want to put up the capital to have your own, the whole idea here behind this program is that you can have a power purchase agreement where you buy power at a discount from a project that's not in Reedfield. As long as it's within the same utility territory, you can negotiate a power purchase agreement with like Nexamp or somebody else um, to benefit the town. And oftentimes that's a better move for smaller towns where you're more worried about, you know, the sand budget. Do you have enough to get through the winter? Are you going to be able to pay your teachers? Um, things to keep the lights on. So uh, not having it be as much of a capital investment and in entering into a power purchase agreement is the way to go. And the options, as I said earlier, the options are endless. And I think it puts you in a good uh, negotiation position to um, find a project where you're buying maybe a portion of it. You can participate as a small buyer in a larger slice of the pie for a larger project remotely. Great. Um, before we get to this next question, um, just a quick time check. So it's, uh, it's five past 12. So we got 25 more minutes for questions, but uh, there's only four questions in the question box. So if others uh, have questions, uh, please type them in now to the Q&A box. We've got plenty more time uh, to get to them. So uh, Nick Lund, I'm gonna pitch this next question over to you. It's from Karen Young. Uh, it's a question about um, the impacts of, of power lines and right of, rights of way um, on solar projects. You know, Nick, you talked about the impacts of you know, citing the solar project itself, but you also need to consider the impact that the, the right of way for the power lines um, create. So um, maybe just talk a little bit about, um, you know, best practices for reducing uh, those, those impacts. Sure, and, and uh, reading the question, I think she's asking whether um, power line right of ways are appropriate places to site solar panels. Um, while right of ways are open spaces and unused spaces and places that, um, you know, could in theory, uh, solar panels could be placed there. They're not really good places uh, to put panels. Uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, sort of the right of way restrictions that are, that are put on the land. Um, companies, uh, CMP and others need to access lines and places and uh, really discourage or prohibit um, uh, anything built in those areas that could hinder their ability to get to lines. And so while in theory, it, those areas may, um, you know, be great places, they're in practical terms, um, not good places. 
Yeah, full disclosure, I read that question wrong. So <laughs> thanks for sure. thanks for clarifying. Appreciate gotcha. it. I saw it up top. <laughs> Perfect. Um, great. So we just had a question coming from Jared Pinkham. Uh, what are typical permitting fees for towns without a solar or site plan review ordinance? Um, so Ben or Chris, maybe that's a question for, for one of you. Uh, sure. Um, I would say that if, if, there, if there's no ordinance on, on um, uh, I, well, the thing that I've seen the most common um, would be that um, if there's nothing in place already, um, essentially what you're looking for is, is your, your standard filing fee, which is not, you know, a couple thousand bucks or something to put the application in. But the biggest question is um, whether the town is going to have a third party engineer Take a look at the plan, uh, take a look at the plans and do a review, which is definitely something that I recommend. Um, and uh, typically, that's done as uh, as an escrow account. Basically, have the developer fund an escrow account to um, you know basically pay the fees of someone doing a third party review here. Um, uh, that way, you can the town can be sure that the uh, you know the, the plans are you know up to code and that there aren't anything in there that they they might miss on a cursory pass through. Um, the one kind of not a caveat, but one thing to add to that is that uh, if it is a site law project where it is where it has gone through um, you know review by DEP, that is a uh, extremely thorough review uh, and certainly more than we've seen on the town level. So um, if the um, if, if there is already been, if there has already been a, a DEP review of that, uh, town might decide that doing their own review is, is less necessary because the DEP has gone over this with a fine tooth comb, but definitely something to consider. Um, typically it's just, you know, the, the, the you know, um, standard fee for just filing something and then uh, making sure that any third party review fees are covered by the developer. Great. Um, so this next question uh, is uh, is more about um, community solar, uh, less about municipal solar, but um, the question is uh, suggestions on how to advise households or small customers on how to weigh different community solar subscription options. Like we heard, there are many companies uh, who are building community solar projects here in Maine, and many of us are getting postcards in our mailboxes and uh, in advertisements. So um, really just sort of looking for um, for guidance on how to um, sort of weigh uh, weigh those options. So uh, Ben, I know you know Next Amp is developing those some of those community solar projects. So, uh, but yeah, uh, so if you want to speak to that? Sure. Uh, so the things that you want to look for um, it are are a couple things. One is that you know are there uh, what was the discount? You know, typically these are done either as a um, a percentage discount. Say you get you know twelve and a half percent discount on your electric bills. Uh, guaranteed going forward, um, or um, I think less common in the community solar space is a, a fixed price rate where you pay, you know, 10 cents per kilowatt hour or, or whatever it ends up being. Um, the, the percentage discount, I think, is a lot uh, more straightforward and probably better for the homeowner because it, it, it guarantees a discount no matter what happens to power prices. Um, and uh, typically those power prices will track with, um, you know, will track with, if, if power prices rise overall as a state, you know, the value of the net metering credits will, will go up as well and that discount will increase a bit. Um, but the, the biggest thing is that you want to look at, um, are there any fees associated? Are you paying the solar company for anything really in this process? Is there a fee for them to, to sign up, uh, to hold your, your spot in the, in the project or to cancel? Um, I know that you know, NextAMPS is the one that I'm most familiar with and we don't have any of those fees. Basically, we've tried to make it as simple as possible for people to sign up because we want people to sign up because we have a lot of projects we need to fill with, um, with customers. So the way that our, our program works is that you, know, you reach out, you send us a copy of your electric bill so we can take a look at your bill to determine how much of the solar project would be allocated to cover most of your electric bills. Um, and then there's, uh, you essentially, once that happens, you sign the contract and then you've held your spot in a solar project. And then there's no costs associated with it um, until the project goes live, then you would start getting a bill. Um, and if it's a, you know, 12 and a half percent discount, I think is what we're offering in Maine. I'd have to check on that, but it's a 12 and a half percent discount. Uh, say you had a hundred dollars worth of credits show up on your bill. 
you know, you would pay us for $87.50, and then that remainder would be your savings. Um, and then in our program, you there's no fee for canceling either. You just have to give us uh, enough of a heads up that we can, uh, you know, utilities typically have rules around how often you can swap out customers on a community solar project, typically about six months. So if you give us some notice that this is happening, then we'll work with you to either reduce the amount that you're um, allocated if you're you know, doing an energy efficiency thing or, you know, um, or, or, or putting solar on your own house, or if you're selling, then, you know, either um, cancel it or move you to the new project if your new house is in uh, you know, the, the same utility service to our territory. So, um, you know, I just described our program. There are a lot of other companies that are doing similar things, but those are the type of things that you want to look for. You know, are there going to be, you know, how much money am I saving? And then are there, are there risks involved? Um, and there was a pretty significant portion of the bill that was passed last year that, that deals with fraud and deals with, you know, making sure that, you know, solar companies are acting in good faith. So um, I, I think that most of, the, most of the contracts that you're looking at will be. I don't think anyone's trying to scam anyone here, but, um, you know, I think that, you know, making sure you're protected and making sure there's no downside risk that you're not aware of are the biggest things. Great, thanks, Ben. Any, uh, anyone else want to add to that answer? Any other perspectives? Uh, if not, this next question is from Cynthia. That's a question, if we're considering local wind power um, to balance uh, solar generation when the sun isn't shining, I think this question really gets to, um, you know, to, to battery technology and, um, you know, how, how advanced we're, we're getting and, uh, and also bill credits. So uh, if somebody wants to speak to, um, uh, to Cynthia's question. I'm not sure who wants to. Uh, I'd be happy to do it. Um, so um, I think wind makes a lot of sense. I think wind power is a, is a great technology. Um, and certainly there's been a, a good amount of, uh, you know, wind development historically in Maine. Uh, I don't know how many are, are currently still in the pipeline, but, um, you know, certainly it can make a lot of sense. Um, in terms of uh, grid balancing, I would say that that's something that is, is, is something that the town basically doesn't really need to be concerned with. Uh, the grid balancing is done um, at the utility and at the um, uh, at ISO New England's level, which is the, the balancing authority for the entire New England grid. Um, and so when they are looking at, so when you, whenever you're applying, whenever you're building a project, you have to, you know, notify, um, you know, ISO New England that this project is happening um, and uh, things around, you know, is the grid balanced or certainly things that are are done on that on that scale um, and, and looking at you know I, I think that there is a, a good case for wind as a you know wind is, is complementary to solar in a lot of ways um, you know the sun gener you know generates during the day and uh, wind tends to blow more at night than during the day at least in, in New England um, but you know I think that that is something that is you know certainly they, they both make sense they both help out on on clean energy and climate um, but I just don't think that it's it's something that is is necessary on a, on a local level because that's all done in the in the big uh, balancing area of New England. Um, battery storage also makes a lot of sense. You know, we've been doing battery storage on a lot of our projects. Um, haven't installed any in Maine yet, but we're we're hoping to. Um, the the benefits of, ba of battery storage are you know yes they 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 allow you to to balance it. They allow you to smooth out the power to make it a more um, consistent uh, power generation from the site and also allow you to continue generating into the evening so that you don't drop off right as you know basically the the peak load is late afternoon into the evening we're doing great in the late afternoon and then we drop off in the evening so if we can continue selling into the evening then um, it's a more attractive product and, and there's some value there on the ISO level as well but um, you know, they, they both make sense they're both great technologies uh, but yeah I think the only thing I would add, to, the only thing I'd add to what Ben's talking about is that we're really at the, uh, yeah, we've had wind for a while, and um, but a lot of that, a lot of that wind power is transmitted and sold out of state. These new programs that we're talking about today are creating a market within Maine, and so uh, I think we're at the forefront of considering how policy can shift in a positive direction. Um, and this is kind of going back to my, my statement earlier that we have got to stick hardcore to being committed to education and being able to discuss how does Maine's renewable energy future really shape 
um, I think is going to be key. Maybe wind is a part of it, but a lot of the wind is, is connected at higher transmission line uh, voltage levels, which means that it's difficult to um, connect it at the distribution level. And so I guess to, without getting too technical here, all the projects that we're talking about, these solar projects are connecting to the lines that you see on route one, on route two. They're not the high voltage transmission lines. They're the ones that connect right at, um, right actually at the load itself. Um, that's why solar works and is able to be distributed. But if wind projects are gonna have an economic benefit from a power purchase agreement standpoint for Mainers, they're gonna have to um, be able to connect at a, um, a lower level. And I'm not sure that we're quite there yet. Definitely part of the conversation though. Um, we've had a long history of wind and there's a lot of great projects to point at, um, but we need to um, kind of see how that goes. And also from a storage standpoint, we don't cur currently have a market mechanism to be able to uh, sell power with storage. Um, so a lot of projects are proposing storage someday. So from a permitting perspective, we will like draw a box on our permit packages and say, maybe someday we'll put a solar, uh, an ener a battery storage uh, project here on this pad. And it's just a small little impervious area that's permitted. Um, but again, we're, we're at the forefront of how Maine can be uh, a market leader from a renewable energy standpoint. And um, that will help to balance uh, this question that, that is about um, you know, load balancing all that. So it's coming, we're just not quite there yet. Great, thanks very much. Um, so there's just one more question in the Q&A box, uh, but we have uh, about 15 minutes left. So if folks have more questions, please type them in the Q&A box. If not, we can wrap up early and I'll have our lunch a little sooner. Um, so this last question uh, really gets to uh, an answer actually that um, we heard uh, with, with Bruce's question from Reedfield. Um, the question is, what are the differences between a town contracting an individual power purchase agreement versus subscribing to a portion of a solar, uh, subscribing to a portion of a solar development? So, um, you know, the differences between a power purchase agreement or subscribing to a different project. Um, Ben, do you want to just kind of reiterate uh, what you said before about the Reed Field project? Yeah, uh, so I, I would say that the in in terms of um, yeah, there there are essentially a, co a couple different ways that towns can can purchase power from solar projects. Uh, one is to essentially be a, a, an anchor customer, is what we call it, so a large a large commercial uh, off taker who is going to be buying uh, you know a large portion of power from one of our solar projects. Um, and that's where their credit worthiness comes into account um, and their overall power usage comes into account. You know, certainly if there are a number of uh, smaller power, us power users, we've been able to uh, kind of stitch them together to, you know, to sell you know, half a megawatt here, two megawatts here and put together uh, enough to finance a larger project. Uh, for towns that don't have much load, that might just have you know, a town hall, um, you know, a fire department building or something and, and not a lot else under the town's municipality. Uh, you know, you're really not looking at a lot from, and you're not looking at enough to, to be a, a significant portion of, of a large solar project. So for that, um, we've had a lot of success basically signing up town accounts as community solar off takers and getting that same community solar deal, which is, you know, typically maybe not quite as big of a discount as you would get for a larger project. Uh, but is one where you're able to take advantage of it and maybe we are able to, you know, satisfy all of your electric load across uh, multiple projects by, you know, doing community solar offtake. So uh, we're certainly, it's certainly flexible. Um, you know, if, if you're, I would say that if, as a, as a general rule of thumb, if you have more than like, you know, a couple hundred kilowatts of, of solar load, then that's something where you might be a, uh, a large commercial offtaker, but a lot of these small project, a lot of these small towns might have you know 25 or 50 kW uh, load from solar, um, and that's enough that it would probably would make more sense to do it as a, a community offtake or you know something like that where um, you know the, the the contracting costs of doing a larger contract are probably not worth it for that amount of savings anyway. Great, we had a question come in under the gun. Uh, are there options? Options for towns to retire the RECs, the renewable energy credits, um, as as a community solar off taker. So, could a town retire RECs if uh, they're a yep. community solar off taker? Um, I I would say yeah, uh, but got to pay for them. <laughs> you know the the that's one of our revenue streams. So 
uh, we can, you know, typically we will um, hang on to the wrecks and then sell them ourselves, uh, you know, to utilities or, or whatnot. Uh, certainly we've done uh, solar deals where we'll sell the wrecks to a town um, or a school or whatnot so that they can, you know, they can claim them and prior them, but uh, that there's certainly a, a cost associated with that. And so, you know, if it's a, um, if it's a, a project where, you know, we're building a, a solar array on a town's rooftop, they can, you know, specify in the RFP that they keep the recs um, and they'll probably still get a viable offer for that. It'll just be, you know, less of a discount than you would get if the solar company was, you know, was keeping the recs. You know, the, the value of, of recs are, you know, a couple cents per kilowatt hour. And so I would expect that the, you know, the rate that you're paying is going to be, you know, a couple cents per kilowatt hour higher if you want to keep the recs. Um, you know, that said, it's certainly can, and it, it's, it's, it's great. Um, that's a way to ensure that the, you know, the solar that you're generating, you're retiring yourself and the, the utilities are going to have to, you know, go out and find additional solar to meet their renewable energy, um, their, their RPS requirements, renewable portfolio standard requirements. So, um, yeah, uh, it, it's, it's great. Uh, and the towns should certainly look into doing that, but just, you know, it, it's, you're not going to get them for free. I, I would also add that, you know, selling RECs is a, is a complicated process. And so if you have a group like Nexamp, they're going to be aggregating their RECs and, and it's all part of their pro forma. So yeah, they're selling them and it's a revenue stream, but they're also able to just get those to market in a way that a town who is not involved in power energy markets to, to do. Um, mm -hmm. And so I just, I know towns want to hang on to that, but in some ways it's better to just pass on the risk of the volatility of those prices changing. Just leave it in Nexamp's hands. I, I would suggest keeping it simple and just engaging on a power purchase agreement level. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, we had another question uh, come in under the gun uh, from uh, Katrina. Um, if we sign up with Nexamp, for example, is the project already in existence or do we need to wait for the development uh, from an earlier Answer Ben. It sounded like you have many projects that you're trying to fill with customers right now. Is that the yeah, case? yeah. Uh, so what what I, uh, what I would say to that is that um, you typically wouldn't be assigned to a project that's already built and operational. Um, like down the road, that might happen a bit where you know we we have a project operating and you know uh, you know a couple percentage of the people leave and then we need to find people to replace them. But right now, and, and what's much more typical is that. Uh, you would be placed on a project that's in, you know, late stage development, but hasn't either hasn't started construction yet or is currently under construction. Um, and then, you know, because we want to basically have the projects fully subscribed by the time the project goes online, uh, because that's our revenue stream. And if we don't have people buying the power at by the time the project comes online, then, you know, we're losing money. So, um, you know, we would have, basically, you would sign up with us, uh, you would be placed in a project that's either, you know, about to start construction or currently under construction um, and then, you know, wait, you know, three to six months or so for the project to actually come online before you would start seeing uh, credits show up on your bill. Excellent. Great. Um, well, before we wrap up, um, Kate, is there anything you wanted to say from KB Cog's perspective? Thank you so much. Um, to those who don't know me, uh, my name is Kate Raymond, and I'm the membership coordinator at KB Cog. And um, here, this meeting is part of our um, said series. And I want to um, I want to echo Todd's thanks in having all of you come today. I also want to extend my thanks to Todd, who really helped to uh, make this happen, along with the rest of our panelists. Thank you, Nick and Nick, Chris, Ben, and Peter, <laughs> for uh, for your time today. Um, and we look forward to continuing our partnerships with you all through our SEDS meetings. Um, we have another one coming up in a few months. And if you'd like to um, stay connected with KVCOG and all that we're doing, uh, feel free to check out our website, sign up for our e-news, um, and uh, potentially follow us on Facebook if that's something that you do. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thanks, Kate. Just before we sign off, uh, just a reminder that uh, everyone who registered for today's program uh, will get an email in the coming days with a recording of this program. Uh, we'll include um, some of this municipal solar um, materials that uh, uh, Maine Municipal Association has made available on their website in which uh, uh, town managers and, and uh, planning board members should have received in the mail recently, um, and also a survey from KV Cog about the program uh, here today. 
Um, so thanks again for tuning in. Um, we really appreciate it and um, have a great afternoon.